Welcome to Introduction to Healthcare and Public Health in the U.S. Regulating Healthcare. This is Lecture C. The component Introduction to Healthcare and Public Health in the U.S. is a survey of how healthcare and public health are organized and how services are delivered in the U.S. It covers public policy, relevant organizations and their interrelationships, professional roles, legal and regulatory issues, and payment systems. It also addresses health reform initiatives in the U.S. The learning objectives for regulating health care are to describe the role of accreditation, regulatory bodies, and professional associations in health care in the U.S. Describe the basic concepts of law in the U.S., the legal system, sources of law, classification of laws, the court system, and the trial process. Describe legal aspects of medicine involving the Affordable Care Act, professional standards in health care, medical malpractice, tort reform, and Medicare and Medicaid fraud and abuse. Describe key components of the Health Insurance Portability and Accountability Act, or HIPAA, and current issues concerning privacy and patient safety in the U.S. And discuss the need for quality clinical documentation for use of the health record as a legal document, communication tool, and a key to prove compliance for healthcare organizations. The Affordable Care Act, or ACA, provided comprehensive healthcare reform. It was passed by Congress and signed into law by President Obama on March 23, 2010. It was contested, and the Supreme Court upheld the ACA on June 28, 2012. The health insurance marketplace began October 1, 2013, and the states had an option to use the federal website or develop their own enrollment site. This act provides millions of Americans more access to affordable health insurance options. Most individuals are required to have health insurance or pay a penalty. The health insurance marketplace allows individuals and small businesses to compare a variety of affordable health plans. Middle and low-income families now receive tax credits that cover a significant portion of the cost of coverage. The Medicaid program was expanded to cover more low-income Americans. ACA also requires that there are plans to cover patients with pre-existing conditions. And finally, the Act provides for free preventive services. Every state, the District of Columbia, and every U.S. territory has its own Medical Practice Act. Each of these acts establishes a state medical board. These boards license physicians and discipline those physicians who break the law. In addition, they investigate complaints about physicians who may be unethical or incompetent. The organization and the authority of state medical boards vary. In some states, the boards are independent and have authority over all licensing and disciplinary matters. In other states, the board is part of another organization, such as the State Department of Health. State medical boards usually include volunteer physicians and members of the public. Legally speaking, a medical standard of care is the level of skill and professionalism that a reasonably prudent physician would provide. A prudent physician is one who is careful, sensible, and uses good judgment. Standards of care usually come from within the medical profession. However, they can also come from entities outside the profession, such as insurance companies. The illustration on this slide shows just a few of the many sources that can contribute to a medical standard of care. Informed consent is the concept that a patient must be fully informed about the proposed treatment before consenting to or refusing the treatment. This is required both legally and ethically. If the patient is a child or is not mentally competent, someone with legal authority must give consent for that person. Other exceptions exist, including principles that apply when a patient is unconscious or in an emergency situation. Informed consent should include more than just handing the patient a form to sign. It should be a process of communication between the patient and the healthcare professional. 
If a patient gives consent but is not fully informed, or if the patient does not give consent and the procedure is performed anyway, that can result in legal problems for the healthcare provider. Meaningful informed consent can be given only if the patient is fully informed about the risks and benefits of the proposed treatment as well as the risks and benefits of other options. The patient must have the opportunity to ask questions and receive understandable answers. If the patient wants time to discuss the treatment plan with others, that should be allowed. After deliberating, the patient should have the opportunity to communicate his or her decision to the treatment team. Some states have proposed or passed legislation to require shared decision-making be part of the informed consent process. Shared decision-making is an informed discussion between providers and a patient to help the patient decide among multiple acceptable healthcare choices. The discussion incorporates, incorporates the patient's priorities and values. Decision aids are tools designed to facilitate the shared decision-making process. These aids include information on the options, risks and benefits of the options, and often include a priority setting activity and some coaching or guidance to prepare for the, for the planned, shared discussion. Patients typically view a decision aid before meeting with their own provider or team of providers to determine the healthcare choice that best matches their values and preferences. A previous lecture in this unit introduced the concept of tort law. This subcategory of civil law deals with something that one person has done to another that has resulted in harm and does not come out of a contractual relationship. The main two types of torts are intentional torts and negligent torts. Most claims of medical malpractice fall under the category of tort law, and the majority of these are based on a theory of negligence. The first element of any tort claim is to establish that the defendant had a duty to the injured party. In a medical malpractice claim, the defendant is generally the healthcare professional or organization that is being accused of negligence. Therefore, the injured person must establish that a professional relationship existed. For example, this could be a doctor-patient relationship, or the patient could simply show that a hospital admitted him or her for treatment. After the relationship is established, a duty of reasonable care is implied. Next, the patient must prove that the care provided was not up to the minimum standard of care that a reasonably prudent professional would provide in similar circumstances. It is not enough that the patient did not get better or even that the patient's condition worsened. The patient must prove that he or she did not receive appropriate treatment and that the healthcare professional's failure to provide appropriate treatment was the proximate or primary cause of the injury. Even if treatment was inadequate, the patient does not have a valid malpractice claim unless he or she was harmed. However, the harm does not have to be physical. For example, if the substandard treatment resulted in provable emotional distress or if the patient had to miss work to receive additional treatment, these could qualify as harm for the purpose of proving a malpractice claim. The statute of limitations is the time limit a patient has for filing a lawsuit. These time limits vary greatly from state to state, ranging from six months to four years. In many instances, however, the time limit does not start to run when the negligent act is committed. Rather, it begins when the negligent act is discovered. This is known as the discovery rule. For example, suppose a surgeon leaves a sponge inside a patient. In states that apply the discovery rule, the patient's time limit for filing a lawsuit would begin when the sponge is discovered, not on the date of the original surgery. As with most of the legal concepts discussed in these lectures, there are many exceptions to these general rules. Good Samaritan laws provide malpractice protection for certain people who provide emergency assistance. Like most other laws about medical negligence, Good Samaritan laws vary by state. However, all of them apply to people who do not have a duty to help under the circumstances, such as a driver who happens to come upon a car accident. It is expected that rescuers will use common sense and not act in ways that are beyond their expertise and capabilities. If the person is being paid or expects to be paid for the services, 
the Good Samaritan law does not apply. In response to criticism of the current system of malpractice, many kinds of reforms have been explored by individual states. A recent report to the Medicare Payment Advisory Commission evaluated the most common tort reform laws. For example, some states require a pretrial screening panel to review the evidence in a case at an early stage and give an opinion about whether the lawsuit is justified. Before a patient can file a medical malpractice claim in court, a qualified medical expert must document that a valid claim seems to exist, and the patient must present this document, called a certificate of merit. Attorney fee limits restrict the amount an attorney can be paid for representing a patient in a malpractice suit. The state might limit the dollar amount the attorney can charge, the attorney's percentage of the total award, or both. Periodic payment allows insurers to pay damage awards in smaller periodic payments rather than in one lump sum. Joint and several liability reform means that if there is more than one defendant, the patient cannot recover the whole amount from any one of them. Rather, each defendant is responsible for only a limited amount of the total damages. Non-economic damages are those that cannot easily be expressed in dollar amounts such as pain and suffering. A cap on these damages limits either the amount of money that the patient can receive or the amount each defendant has to pay. The report to the Medicare Commission assessed the results of these and two other tort law reforms. The results considered were costs, the frequency of malpractice claims, the supply of healthcare services, the quality of care, and the need for physicians to practice so-called defensive medicine, such as sending the patient for excessive testing in order to protect themselves. The only tort reform that significantly improved these results was the cap on non-economic damages. One proposed reform, now being evaluated, is for a panel of experts to predetermine what non-economic damages are appropriate in a lawsuit. In this approach, the various possible medical injuries are listed and ranked by severity. For each level of severity, a range of dollar values is assigned for allowable non-economic damages. Health courts are an alternative to the regular court system, and many variations have been proposed. A major difference between health courts and regular courts is that in a health court, the expert witnesses are neutral instead of being paid by one side or another. Another major difference is that the judge or hearing officer must be knowledgeable about healthcare matters. In disclosure and offer programs, institutions encourage healthcare professionals to tell patients about medical errors. In appropriate cases, the institution offers modest compensation so the parties do not need to go to court. A safe harbor law reduces or eliminates defendants' liability if they can show that they followed a reasonable standard of care. One proposal is that health care professionals have a safe harbor if they follow evidence-based practice guidelines. These are typically published guidelines that are based on the latest medical research. The report to the Medicare Commission concluded that there is not yet enough evidence to properly evaluate any of these newer reforms. However, the report said the existing evidence is promising enough to justify demonstration projects to gather more information. The Affordable Care Act authorizes $50 million in grants to states to develop, implement, and evaluate alternatives to tort lawsuits. Another venue in which law and medicine interact is in the Medicare and Medicaid programs. The U.S. Department of Health and Human Services has an Office of Inspector General, or OIG, that protects the integrity of Medicare, Medicaid, and other government programs. The OIG defines fraud as gaining a benefit by intentional misrepresentation or concealment of relevant facts. Waste means incurring unnecessary costs as a result of poor management practices or controls. Abuse refers to excessive or improper use of government resources. In cases of fraud, waste, or abuse, the OIG can pursue both criminal and civil penalties. 
Five major federal laws address Medicare and Medicaid fraud, waste, and abuse. Briefly, the False Claims Act prohibits the submission of false or fraudulent claims to the federal government. The anti kickback statute forbids asking for or receiving anything of value in exchange for referrals of federal health care program business. The Stark Law prohibits physicians from referring Medicare or Medicaid patients to clinical laboratories and certain other services in which they have a financial interest. The Exclusion Statute bans individuals or organizations convicted of certain crimes from being providers in the Medicare and Medicaid programs. The Civil Monetary Penalties Law authorizes the OIG to impose fines on healthcare providers who commit fraud, waste, or abuse. This concludes Lecture C of Regulating Healthcare. In summary, a number of complicated laws apply to healthcare. Moreover, the system is changing rapidly because of the Affordable Care Act and the many proposals for tort law reform. However, the basics of health care law remain the same. Health care providers must obtain informed consent from their patients, and they must provide care that is consistent with reasonable standards. In addition, if they are Medicare or Medicaid providers, they must conduct their practices in accordance with the federal standards for those programs.